Okay. Well, I'm Ann Bauer, and I'm here to introduce Karen Middleman, who's graciously reading today uh, from her book, Gone Bolshevik and Answering Questions, um, maybe discussing her writing process a little. I don't know what she has planned exactly. Uh, I just want to remind you that our events are free. Uh, we run on grants and contributions. Um, there's a basket at the back if you happen to be able to help us with that. And also we have sponsors, and they are the Jack and Dorothy Byrne Foundation, Pauline Davenport Children's Fund of the Vermont Community Foundation, the Vermont Humanities Council, and the Woodstock Learning Lab, and we also give spank thanks, not spanks, thanks, <laughs> to our media sponsor, the Vermont Standard, WCTV Channel 8, Woodstock Community TV, the Yankee Bookshop, Vermont's oldest bookshop, and sustainable Woodstock. Karen and her husband moved to Vermont in 2017, but her Vermont roots go deep. She's been coming here with family since elementary school. Her family has a house near Stratton Mountain. Her novel, Gone Bolshevik, has Vermont roots too. It was published by Shire Press um, down in Manchester. Karen's background is in public service uh, and in the arts, and that has involved working at museums and the National Endowment for the Humanities. She's long been an essayist and a poet with publications in such places as the Adirondack Review, Red River Review, the Comstock Review, and other journals. She's even been nominated for a Pushcart Prize. That's amazing. Um, now she's turned to fiction. Gone Bolshevik has already won an award for literary fiction from the Maryland Writers Association, and today we're going to hear some of it. The novel takes us into a family dealing with a father's terminal illness, his own denial, and his daughter's struggle to balance care for him and for her own family, all of this told with poetic grace and insight. So please join me in welcoming Karen to Bookstock. Thank you, Anne, for that lovely introduction. Thanks to Bookstock for putting on this wonderful event. And thank you all for coming. I'm really glad you could be here with me. So one of the things that I've heard is that when people hear the title of my book, Gone Bolshevik, they think that they're in for a political thriller or something about the Russian Revolution. Well, they're not. Um, the title actually comes from a medical text that was used widely in the United States and Canada back in the 1950s and 60s. So this was the height of the Cold War, and it was also a time when we didn't know very much about cancer. The medical community was just figuring out how cancer cells grew and how to combat them. So if you open the, the pages of this text, and turn to the section about cancer, there's a passage in it that describes cancer cells as ordinary cells gone Bolshevik. So that's where the title comes from. It's fascinating to me that at the height of the Cold War, we were so captivated by communism that we actually imagined the cells in our bodies could be possessed by the communists. So I, there's something about that that just stuck with me. And when I was looking for a book title, that's that's what I decided on. So if you were hoping for a reading about the Russian Revolution, that's not it. The novel is about a man named Stan Gershman, who is a New York attorney and has just been diagnosed with esophageal cancer. I'm going to read three passages. And the first two are from the perspective of Stan. And the last one is from the perspective of his daughter, Sarah. And the only other thing you need to know is that at this point in the book, Stan has just undergone a, a rather radical operation. So it's a procedure that has only been performed at two hospitals in the nation to remove part of his tongue, most of his esophagus, and a piece of his larynx, which is our voice box. And the reason the surgery is radical and rather experimental is the doctors are promising him that he has a chance, although it's a slim one, because they've left part of the larynx, that with a lot of speech therapy, he'll be able to speak again. So that's all you need to know. A man wakes up to discover he has no voice. 
It's like being inside a damn Kafka novel, Stan growls to himself as he stretches his legs. He tries painfully to turn his head around and look at the hospital room he finds himself in. He wishes he could growl out loud. He wants desperately to yell, to snarl, to bellow, to utter any one of the animal sounds rising in his throat. He tries to cough to see if maybe he can produce just a tiny sound. And the sudden jolt of pain stuns him, sends him back against the pillow hard. They've told him to try not to speak for a week, to let his larynx heal. The enforced silence terrifies Stan. Inside his head, it's anything but silent. His words pour on steadily like breaths, each one inflicting fresh pressure inside his skull, a mounting tide of words clamoring for release. Linda, that's his wife, Linda always describes him as a word person. Stan is a word person in the deepest sense. It's not just that he loves the crossword puzzle or he can complete the daily cryptogram in under 30 seconds. These are skills he firmly believes anyone with half a brain could muster. For Stan, words are much more than a game or a tool. They are his currency. They're his religion. He depends on his words. He doesn't know where he exists in the world without them. He looks around, taking stock of where he is in this room. There's a pulse monitor clamped to his finger and one IV line flowing into his arm, attached to a contraption on wheels. So, he is mobile. Stan feels a slight urge to pee. He wonders fleetingly if he should call a nurse, then rejects that idea. He shifts his legs around to one side of the bed and touches one socked foot to the floor, moving with exquisite care. So far, so good. He slides to a standing slides to a standing position gingerly and shuffles over to the tiny bathroom. Shuffles. Now there's a word he didn't think would apply to him until he was about 95 years old. And only a 16-pointer in Scrabble. Peeing is evidently out of the question. Nothing in his body seems to want to function normally. Stan's legs are suddenly shaking uncontrollably, and he grips the metal sink basin in the bathroom for support and stares around the room, avoiding his own face in the mirror. He notices a pink plastic basin with soap, toothbrush, and a razor, and he lifts the razor for a moment, testing the blade with one finger. A clear picture comes to him then of what he must do. Bring the razor to his throat and cut this thing out. Butcher the damn thing before it butchers him. He has seen the anatomical diagrams. If he shaved away skin and tissue, layer by layer, couldn't he get down to the truth of it all? He needs to touch it, to feel where all this madness began, to assess for himself the kind of purchase it might have on him. A wave of nausea and chills steals even those momentary thoughts of victory. Stan tries to call out and again is rocketed by pain. He's doubled over as he lands hard on the toilet seat and rests his forehead on the cool rim of the sink, managing to bang loudly with the knuckles of his left hand, the one without the IV, against the metal basin. Stan finds himself tucked back into bed some time later, pain medication flowing blissfully through his IV bag. He reaches for the remote control and turns on the television above his bed. Cable television news is so insipid, it infuriates him. Jennifer Lopez and Ben Affleck are engaged. Another big corporate corporation files for Chapter 11 after inflating its profits. He flips foggily through the channels until he finds Giada de Laurentiis leaning over a steaming plate of eggplant parmesan, her lips wide and luscious. For the next hour, Stan watches cooking shows, his eyes following spoons full of sautéed vegetables gleaming with oil, mesmerized by peppercorn-crusted roasts and freshly baked cinnamon rolls piped with white icing. Giada, the narrator intones, enjoys long walks on the beach and yoga. She always keeps a secret stash of green tea and dark chocolate in her purse, just for emergencies. Well, Stan thinks, isn't that remarkable? With this promise of more fun facts about his favorite Food Network star, Stan is finally lulled back to sleep. 
When Linda arrives at the hospital the next day, Stan has been waiting for her for more than an hour. He motions for her to set up her laptop, then scrolls impatiently until he comes to the page he's looking for, the Herman Miller Furniture website. Here it is, the lounge chair designed in 1956 by Charles and Ray Eames, the most inventive furniture designers of his generation. They had taken plywood and bent it, molded it into the precise, supple curves of this exquisite chair, and then sheathed it in leather. leather. Charles Ames said his greatest desire was for this, this chair to feel like a well-oiled baseball mitt. The chair embodies comfort and utter luxury wrapped up together. Stan stabs a finger at the screen, shaking his head. Linda sips her coffee, looks at him quizzically, waiting a beat. We're buying chairs, she asks. Walnut, white ash, he points to the choice of finishes on the screen. Linda smiles slightly, uncertainly, and then she gives in to Stan's enthusiasm. He can smell her green apple shampoo when she leans over him briefly to point to the chair that she likes, and the deep, sweet scent makes him unaccountably happy. Linda has chosen exactly the wood that he would have picked, the oiled Santos palisander, with a rich, deeply textured grain. He and his previous wives could never agree on furniture. When he and Evie got married, Stan was still in law school, and they pieced together a household from local thrift shops and a friend's cast off linens and, pot and pottery. Even after they moved to the suburbs, Evie had never really taken to decorating their house. Then wife number two came along and tried to bury him with her overly fussy Victorian sofas and acres and acres of plaid upholstery. Neither of them had ever seemed to appreciate Stan's love of modern design. He waves at the screen. There is just no arguing with the brilliance of this chair. Time magazine declared it the greatest design of the 20th century. With its sleek, elegant curves and streamlined look, the chair won accolades for modern design, ahead of the Swatch watch and the S1 steam locomotive, for God's sake. Stan has heard that the original lounge chairs, designed in Brazilian rosewood, now sell for as much as $1,700 each. Linda doesn't seem to understand the meaning of his wave. Buy it, Stan scrawls. He writes the words in big, excited letters on his notepad. When he glances up at his wife's face, he sees the precise second when everything falters. Linda pushes a strand of hair away from her eyes. I don't know, Stan, she begins. He can taste the quickening, her faith set against his. He tries to make light of it, scribbling, it's only money, honey. When that doesn't bring a smile to Linda's face, he turns away and stares stonily at the laptop screen. Stan is not about to make this moment pass him, to let this moment pass him by. If he's gonna battle this damn thing, he requires beauty to fortify himself. He will need to be surrounded by grandeur, by power, by lines that are true, by something he can hold on to. He vows to buy the lounge chair for his law office as soon as he gets the hell out of here. The Santos Palisander in orchid white leather with a matching ottoman. Sarah. By the time you lose your parents, you're supposed to be grown up enough to handle it, Sarah knows. The only thing nobody tells you is that your entire body will hurt when you wake up worse than when you had the flu, and that your father, who's about to die, will visit your dreams every night, mumbling incoherently like a madman or a drunk on the streets. Last night, she stuck earplugs in both ears and pressed her eyes tightly closed beneath her sleep mask, hoping she could shut out the dreams, but there they were anyway. Her father riding bareback on, on a black horse along steep cliffs, or camping alone in a giant, dense Amazonian rainforest, or maneuvering, maneuvering his bicycle through New York City traffic with daredevil flair. The dreams always end the same way, with her father staring directly into Sarah's eyes and shaking a finger at her while trying to tell her something. Trick yaks, he seemed to be saying urgently in last night's dream. Murky softballs, 
salty pretzels. Sarah has no idea what the dreams mean. She opens a bag of pretzels and eats them for breakfast. Maybe if she does what he says, he'll go away. Maybe if she keeps dreaming him, he'll never go away. Her ache to hear her father's voice is more powerful than she ever could have imagined. It is deeper, and Sarah is ashamed to, to say it, far deeper than her urge for sex. More like her yearning for her son when he was an infant. She can remember the physical imprint that Zach as a baby left on her skin. The way his damp head fit into the space between her neck and her shoulder, leaving her with a hollow, scooped out feeling of loss when he was lifted from her into someone else's arms. This is the same kind of ache, gnawing at her sleep, filling her with a restless desperation, the kind of physical longing she imagines could make someone jump off a bridge in, to slice into icy dark waters below. At the end of her father's first week home from the hospital, when she calls the apartment and has to speak to him through Danny, an Ethiopian nurse who doesn't know her father and has never even heard his true voice, Sarah abruptly hangs up the phone. Roland has to talk her out of jumping immediately on a train to New York. Sarah knows that she has utterly lost her bearings. The single thing she has relied on to be her compass, the sound of home, can no longer take her there. Her father has resumed going to work at his law practice now, at least one or two half days each week. On Monday mornings, when she knows that he and Linda will both be at the office, Sarah dials the apartment phone number just to hear his voice on the old answering machine message. It is scratchy and rough and dearly familiar and gone as irrevocably as someone who has died. The jerky guttural mumblings that her father can manage now after enduring a few weeks of speech therapy will never smooth themselves out into quite these particular sounds that she's listening to now as she punches the number in again and again. She hears him speaking at odd moments like a phantom limb. His voice echoes in her mind the way for months after her dog Ruby was hit by a car, she could hear over and over again the exact high yip the dog made going under the wheels. Her father had been visiting her at college that day. He stood in her apartment in his white boxers, smoking the morning's first lucky strike when she stumbled through the door holding Ruby wrapped up in her jacket. You better get that dog to a vet, her father had advised. She doesn't look so good. Sarah drove the 10 careening miles to the veterinary hospital with one hand on the steering wheel and the other bracing the dog whose head was lolling, lolling crazily in the front seat, her breath catching in little gasps. It wasn't the gasping sound that stayed with Sarah afterward though but that last piercing yelp in the split second before the car hit, before Ruby felt the impact. It was the sound of something before it happened, before the future shouted its name. Thank you. So I'll be happy to take any questions. So this book is actually based on my father's experience and my family's experience with watching my dad go through esophageal cancer. And it's, when I first started this, I thought I was writing a memoir. I thought that I, what I was doing was trying to capture my family's experience as accurately as I could. I'd never written a memoir before. I'd only written poetry and essays. And I spent about three years writing several really bad drafts of a memoir. Um, they were all written from inside my own feelings and my own experience with very little distance. And you all know if you've read memoir or written memoir, that's a very bad thing. That's not how you want to approach memoir. But the other thing that's kind of stopped me in my tracks, there were two things. The first is that I realized I don't have very many precise memories, physical memories, the way that some people do. So I've read a lot of memoir recently and I read it was actually Michelle Obama's memoir. She was describing a piano lesson that she took when she was 10 years old. And she could describe every detail of the room 
in her piano teacher's apartment down to the potted plant on the windowsill. I can't for the life of me conjure that level of physical detail about most of my childhood. And so I was kind of stymied when I tried to come up with precise physical details, the kinds of things that place you as a reader in the moment that you really need to carry a memoir forward. So that was obstacle number one. I just didn't have the physical memories. And obstacle number two was that my experience as a daughter kept getting in the way of my skill as a writer. And it just, it, it just didn't work. So I went on a writing retreat with a very talented editor who encouraged me to try to write fiction instead. And I kind of dismissed it. I wasn't that interested in it. But I toyed around with it a bit. And I wrote a few scenes from different points of view as if they were fiction instead of memoir. And it was incredibly liberating because what it did is it freed me from the sense of deep obligation that I had as a daughter to accurately capture my father's experience. Instead, I was writing about a fictional character, Stan Gershman. And quickly, the daughter in, in the book, Sarah, also became someone who was not me, which was also equally liberating, because I was able to capture the emotional truth of my family's experience, but without the weight of having to get every little detail right. So anyway, for me, it was, it was incredibly liberating to move from memoir to fiction. And that's how I decided to write a novel. I'm going to just leave that there. <laughs> Maybe I should put it up here. Yes? In uh, writing about death and dying, mm -hmm. did it make you more conscious of your own mortality, more fearful of death? Did it change how you, growing older, no offense, how you, <laughs> as we all are, how you feel about that? That's a, a really great question. So I remember. When my dad was first diagnosed, and he was given months to live, and by the way, he, he lived almost four years after the diagnosis, so um, he, we were very lucky. We had a lot of time with him after he was diagnosed. But I remember asking him that question, asking him if it made him feel like he had to, to capture every moment if, as if time was precious, and he looked at me like he just couldn't even understand what language I was speaking, and he said, I'm just trying to get through tomorrow, because he was so consumed by the, the task of healing his body and dealing with the physical pain that he had, no, he had lost all perspective. But for the rest of the family, including me, yes. I think it threw us all into the sense of reevaluating our lives and thinking about, um, you know, not to, to spout cliches, but living more in the moment and, not, and recognizing that our time is, is scarce. So it absolutely did. I guess what struck me is that it didn't change that for him. Yeah, Ken. Um, I have a friend who's writing a book, and if you talk about the characters in the book, she can tell you everything about them. Mm -hmm. No, 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 she thinks this, she yeah. knows that. She, mm -hmm. Are your characters still developing in your mind even after the book is done? Oh, um, no, because I'm writing something else, and so I'm getting consumed by so another set of characters. But I know what you're talking about, because I found myself like understanding what kind of breakfast cereal Sarah and Stan would like. And the, in fact, the moment that I knew that Sarah was the daughter in the novel, that she was no longer me, was when I realized that she likes a breakfast cereal that I don't like, that she doesn't like taking long walks in the morning, which I love, that there were all these things about her character that I kind of resisted because I wanted her to be more like me. Um, and in fact, she emerged as very much her own person and really not me. Uh, which is something I had heard writers say and frankly internally kind of rolled my eyes when I heard it. Um, but, but it happened to me as well, so. Yes? Uh, well, I think it's going to be a memoir, but stay tuned, it could turn into a novel. <laughs> I'm actually trying to write a memoir about a completely different subject at a completely different stage of my life, but I don't know if that will also turn into fiction, I'm not sure. Yes. Do you start on a project with an idea about um, how lengthy it'll be, how many words you're looking to, to is a memoir shorter than a work of fiction? And you, you... Well, the way that I'm, the way that I'm writing now is actually in very small vignettes. There are a couple of authors I admire a lot who have done this. Minnie Bruce Pratt and Dorothy Allison have both written memoirs that are, rather than in chapter form, 
they're a series of tiny little vignettes, each one its own discrete scene. And you move from one to the next, sometimes without a sense as a reader of what the exact connection is, but by the time you read three or four of them, the connections emerge. That's how I'm trying to write this memoir. So I have a sense of the length of each piece. N none of them so far have gone beyond two typed pages. Um, but I don't have a sense of the, the work as a whole yet, because I'm, I'm at the very beginning. That's an interesting question, though. I don't think I've ever started out, except when I was doing my PhD dis dissertation, then I definitely had a page limit in mind. <laughs> um, and a certain number of pages I had to hammer out every day, but, um, but I don't usually approach it that way. Anne. So, um, as somebody who's tried to write novels, but mm -hmm. never taken them to the publication stage, <clears throat> one of the things I found was that when I was writing, it almost felt sometimes like I was a little nuts because I was like in this other world. Mm -hmm. And I had to find a way to kind of transition into and out of that, mm -hmm. back into so-called normal life. Do you, do, you, do you, writing this fiction, do you have that same kind of sensation? Yes, in fact, I had to leave home to, to most times to write this, and my family could attest to that. I wrote most of this novel at a wonderful writing retreat called The Porches in the mountains outside Charlottesville, Virginia. I went there seven times, sometimes for a week, sometimes for a weekend, once for two weeks, and I had to physically get away to allow myself to get into that space where I could just write completely. I would sometimes wake up and write from three in the morning till six in the morning and then go back to sleep. I think for me, being on, in my own time, space, and on my own rhythm is essential to writing. Otherwise, I, I just can't. It doesn't work. I remember Toni Morrison said when, that she would write at 3 o'clock in the morning, because that's the only time she knew that her daughter was asleep, and when no one in the household needed her. From 3 to 5 in the morning, every morning, she wrote all of her novels that way. So. Becky? I'm running into some of the same issues, but I decided actually part of what I'm writing about is the loss of memories of my childhood. So that problem is actually part of the subject matter, which, you know, because I'm writing about um, a kind of rupture in my family when my mom left. When I was in high school, she left my dad. Uh, and most families that go, it, when children in a family go through any kind of rupture or trauma, from tiny things to, you know, children who have gone through genocide and, and true trauma, they often lose their childhood memories. They often, there's a wall that goes down in your mind to protect you from um, what isn't true any longer. And so I'm writing about that process, which frees me if I'm writing a scene and I don't remember anything, then I write about the not remembering. And sometimes that's a gateway into um, telling something true about that moment, that era in my family's history. So that's, my, that's what I'm choosing to believe at the moment. We'll see if it works. <laughs> yes? I know you've joined a writer's group. Can you <laughs> tell the group how working with a group like that has affected your writing or helped or whatever? Oh yeah, great question. It's essential. It, it's so important to me to be able to share my work and get feedback. And it also is a very useful kick in the butt because we have, in a writer's group, you have to show up with something written to share when it's your turn to share. And so I found myself very often on a Sunday saying, oh my God, we're meeting on Tuesday and I have to write, it's my turn, and I just I have to write something. So it's good to have that structure and that need to, to uh, produce even when you don't feel like it. And it's wonderful to have a group of people to, who are writers who I admire and enjoy spending time with to read my work and share their feedback. It's terrific. It's like a lifeline. Yeah. So is that, is that more effective for you if you have like a set time, like, okay, I need to, I need to write, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to write, and I'm going to do it? Or do you, is, it, is it more effective for you to just like, when an idea comes to you, you need to go sit down and write it? Or do more? Yeah, that's a good question. So both. Because I, things come to me, and they, all, they always seem to come to me when I'm driving and when I can't write. And I actually have almost uh, driven off the road because I keep a notepad on my front seat and I sometimes have tried to write while I'm, while I'm driving. Now I, I pull off the road and I, I write in my notebook. So I do write things down as they come to me. But I have found ever since I had a child 
that I had to steal time when I had it. Um, you know, the old saying that everyone tells mothers, sleep when the baby sleeps, and you think you can't fall asleep, but you can because you're so exhausted. So, you know, your sense of time changes when you become a mother. My sense of needing to carve out a special kind quality of time for writing just disappeared once I became a mother. If I had five minutes, I would sit down and try to write. If I had 10 minutes, I would sit down and try to write. If I had an hour, that was bliss, and I would sit down and write. But I got really good at being able to, to kind of turn it on and off. So thank you for that. That's my son, by the way. <laughs> so one, maybe last question, mm -hmm. somebody else's a burning question. In that writer's group, um, do you sometimes find that you get contrary reactions from mm -hmm. people, and how do you handle that? I mean, how do you resolve it in, in trying to make use of it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. We definitely have different personalities in our group and very strong personalities. And so, so sometimes you'll read something and someone will say, well, that ending doesn't work for me. It's really a little unclear and I wanted to know more about X. And someone else says, no, 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 it's exactly right. I don't think you want to go into more depth about X. That will take us out of the moment. And so you're left with two very competing ideas. I have a pretty strong sense of where I want my own writing to go, I will, sense, I, I will say, so I just, I, I kind of trust my instincts in that moment, and I find that sometimes I listen to one or the other, but I'm, I, I, I've also gotten feedback that I'm, from people that I'm really surprised by and that has sent me back to the drawing board. I mean, if everyone in the group says, you know, this paragraph really doesn't work, even if I'm in love with that paragraph, obviously I need to pay attention to that. So that's, that's one of the wonderful things that the group does for me. Any other questions? Oh. Yep. Um. Poetry and fiction seem very different. Have you abandoned poetry for fiction, or do you go in and out? I go in and out, and sometimes actually I'll write a poem as a way into a subject, because I think it comes more naturally to me, because I started out as, as a poet. And so I'll write a poem, sometimes a really bad poem, but I'll write a poem as a way into a subject that I'll later write an essay or a memoir piece about. And I'll ditch the poem. It won't ever be something that I'll work on again. But it's, it's the way in because it comes most easily to me, I think. So. I might add, I find some of your passages in the book very poetic. Thank you. As did I listen. Yeah. Thank you all very much. Yeah, and so